Welcome, welcome, welcome. Don't you love the gentle reminders from the Father? The faithfulness of God to speak those small whispers of correction or desire into you. I had such a hard time sleeping last night. I just, I couldn't sleep. I was awake. I would sleep. I was awake. I was asleep. And I had lunch with my best friend, and I was talking to her about it, about how I just could not sleep at all. And she said, I couldn't sleep either. I said, well, I pretty much know why I couldn't. I was playing a game on my tablet, and all night long, that game, when I'd wake up, that game was what was in my mind. You know, just thinking about that game and how I could have played this better or put these words better. It was just a word game of scrambled letters and putting them in the right order. But it was in my mind. And as I was driving here, just meditating and praying, I sat in the parking lot for a while before I came to the studio. And God reminded me about that very thing, that what I put in myself before I sleep is what my mind meditates on. And though I listen to Bible studies throughout the night, I just, every time I wake up, I would click on a Bible study. I sleep to Bible studies constantly. I just want the word in me. But I, but I put something else in my mind. Now, it doesn't mean that these are bad things, but God was reminding me that what we put in is what we meditate on. What we see with our eyes goes in, and it's what we think about. And it was that gentle reminder that I, I need to dedicate my time, even when I'm sleeping, to Him. Now, that sounds so super spiritual, and it may sound ridiculous to some, but what God's trying to show us and show me is that I need to keep my eyes on the prize, my focus on him. And even when I go to sleep, the last thing before I go to bed should not be filling myself with worldly things. They are not bad. They are not evil. They're not wrong. They're just world. And God... This is not for everybody, but for me, it was that gentle reminder that the things of this world hold nothing for me. They don't hold my attentions, my affections, and they shouldn't hold my whole night, right? That belongs to God. So tonight, I dedicate my night to the Lord. And I'm going to ask him to be the Lord of my thoughts and my dreams. I'm going to ask him to be the song of the night, because that's what his word declares, that he is the song in the night. I learned my lesson by a still, small whisper from a faithful father who wants only the best for me. My God wants me to have a good night's sleep. He's not doing this correction because he's angry or upset. He's doing it because he loves me, and he wants his very best. And a good night's sleep is his very best. So here's, here's what I'm saying. When you go to bed tonight, dedicate it to him. Well, we, ded we set aside our days for him. We, we dedicate our days and say, God, you know, we give you our day. We give you our, our job. We give you our family. Tonight, give him your sleep and see if we don't all sleep a little deeper a little more sound, and wake up a little better refreshed than what I was today. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, I have a message today, another great title, God, you know, God works with me in titles, and another unsung hero in the Bible. God has been showing me these unknown, unsung heroes and places and circumstances and situations all through his word that we don't normally hear about or teach about or hear preached. And I have a message today called Be a Dodo. Be a Dodo! Now, this is not some kind of slam against you. It's not anything like that. But it's powerful. It is it, it is a it is life changing. If we can adhere and gain and glean from this word and adhere to the principles of this word, oh, I'm telling you, things will change when you go to battle. I want to introduce you to a man named Eliezer, son of Dodo. 
Eliezer, son of Dodo. Let me give you this. He's one of David's mighty men. And this is an account in 2 Samuel where they are telling us about David's mighty men, and they're naming off some of the men and what they had done. And in this list is a man named Eleazar, son of Dodo. But what he is known for, when I read it to you, you'll be able to teach this to yourself. You won't even need me. It's so fantastically clear how this is going to roll out. So this is 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 10. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Jasheb Bashabeth the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. He was also called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel had retreated. He, Eleazar, son of Dodo, arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand cleaved or stuck or adhered to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. Can it preach itself? You probably already know where I'm going. So Eliezer was one of three men, the Bible says, mighty men who were with David when they defied the Philistines and were gathered there for battle, and the other men of Israel had retreated. Three men battling the Philistines, and others had retreated. Well, sounds like perfect odds for God, right? So here's the picture. Eliezer, the Bible says, his hand grew weary, but in the weariness, his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about an exceedingly great, because that's the word in the Hebrew, not just great, but an exceedingly great victory or rescue in the Hebrew. And then the others, those who had retreated, only returned after him to plunder. He did all the hard work, and they came behind him and plundered the Philistines. So let me talk to you about two things, the sword and then the grip, because both are powerful. So we know that the sword is the word. Ephesians chapter 6, we'll get there in a second, but Ephesians talks about that we have the armor of God, and one of the things we have, the only offensive weapon, is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is the sword, it is the Spirit's sword, it's the Word of God, but it's, the, it's not my sword. It doesn't say the sword of Jenny, the Word of God, it's the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. It is the spirit using the sword or the word for battle. I just sort of hang on to the sword, but the spirit uses the sword and the sword is his for battle. It, Ephesians, it's amazing. It, this enables us to stand our ground against evil, against the enemy. This is Ephesians 6.13. We're not going to put it on the screen, but you know it's chapter 6 is the armor of God. And we have the sword of the spirit. Now the sword is offensive and defensive weapon. And uh, let me just give you the history. It's used by soldiers. In, in this case, the sword that Paul refers to here is the word of God. It's the word of God. And so where, where can we go with this? this? This is so easy to teach. I mean, this almost is just playful for me, and joyful, because it's, it, it just falls out. It's just, it just falls out of the spirit part of me that Eleazar, the son of Dodo, had the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and he was able to vanquish the enemy with the sword of the spirit. And even though he was battle weary, he never let go of the word. You see, we can become so 
and battled and so wearied from the battle that we stop battling with the word. You declare, you declare, you stand, you stand, and you say, I've got this scripture, and I've got this scripture, and I quote the scripture, and I repeat the scripture, and I hold fast to this verse. This is my life verse. This is my victory verse. This is my praise song that I'm doing right now. I'm singing for victory right now. And we stand, and we stand, and then we start not standing, and we get weary, and we start forgetting each day to speak that word and we let other things get in our way and we think well maybe if the word's not working I'll, I'll use another sword I'll, I'll try this or I'll try that uh, I'll go my way I'll do it a different way because the word just doesn't seem to be working I'm not, I'm not winning this battle and so we become weary of standing with the word but when Eliezer was weary, it said his hand still clung to the sword. So let me show you that we know this is, this is powerful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God, the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's not just a two-edged, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and of the marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Here the word is described as living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. We're talking about the time in the Roman Empire, and so my mind clicks back to trying to remember what soldiers looked like back then and what they were battling with back then. Because if I put that context into today, I don't understand it as well. So my mind constantly goes back. And a Roman sword was, const was, was made in this manner, that it was two-sided. It wasn't just sharp on one side, like we have carving knives in our kitchen. That's why my mind has to think that and not what I'm used to today. So it, it was sharper, um, sharp on both sides, and it was sharper than that, Paul says, that God's word is sharper than having a blade that is uh, deadly on both sides. It had two edges, and it made it easier to penetrate as well as to cut in every way because it didn't just cut going in, it would then cut coming out. It pierces and penetrates. Hear these words. The word pierces and penetrates. It reaches even into the heart or the very center of action, and it lays open all of the thoughts and the feelings and everything that it touches. And so it's penetrating. The word is penetrating and powerful. The purpose of the sword of the word is to make us strong and able to withstand the evil onslaught of Satan, our enemy. Without a sword, we are defenseless. Now the Holy Spirit, like I said in the beginning, this is the Holy Spirit's sword. I'm just taking hold of it. I'm not going, this is in the name of Jenny. I'm, I'm swinging my sword in the name of whatever, or this is my dad's sword or my, my cousin's sword. This is the sword of the Spirit. It is his sword, but I have to wield it. I have to use it. It is his sword, the power of the Spirit in the sword, but I have to direct it. How do I do that? With the word. The more, the more, the more we use it, the more powerful we come in it. God's word has the power to change every situation that we encounter. It is that powerful. His word can defeat the enemy then, and it defeats the enemy now. And when Christ comes in final judgment, when Jesus returns for his second coming, he will speak mm, 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 
so powerfully. Let me show you this picture. If, if, if this doesn't convince you of the power that Eliezer, the son of Dodo, had in his hand, then I, I don't know that anything will. This is Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. This is my Jesus. This is our God. Revelation 1, 16. In his, Jesus, in his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. This is what John the Revelator is showing us. This picture of Christ coming with seven stars in his right hand, the fullness of the Spirit. And out of his mouth came a double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. The scripture says in Revelation later on in the chapter that his name is the Word. Faithful and true in his name is the Word. So what does this picture of Eliezer, the son of Dodo, mean to us? We are in a battle. We are deep in a battle for some of us. We are fighting for our very lives or the lives of loved ones. I mean, I'm not talking like, you know, a little tiny skirmish. We're in a battle, folks. Satan hates you, and he hates me because we love him, and he hates him. And his whole job is to seek and devour and destroy and kill those who love God. He wants us to distrust God, to doubt God. He wants us to turn away from God. He wants our relationship completely and utterly cut off. And we are in a war. But God has given us a weapon so powerful that Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, battled until he was weary. Weary. He wasn't strong and powerful at this point. He had battled and battled and battled, and he became tired and probably doubtful of the victory. But he never let go of the sword. Saints, when we are in a battle and we become weary, we can never let go of the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God that, that is so sharp that it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it penetrates into the enemy and into the enemy's camp. But let me talk to you about the grasp. Because the sword is only useful in the grasp of a believer. Others can use God's word, but without it being under the power of the Holy Spirit and that guidance, they're just loud clanging symbols. But to those of us who love his word, who believe his word, who speak it, memorize it, meditate on it, declare it, confess it, profess it, to those of us, that sword is powerful in our grip. But let me talk to you about the grasp. The enemy knows the power of my grasp in my, on that sword. And what Satan will want to do is to take that sword and to take it out of my hands. He wants to wrest that sword away from me. If he can get me to stop declaring the word, stop believing the word, or begin to doubt the word, he has victory in my life. And so Satan will always try to wrangle that sword out of my grasp. But if the grasp is weak, the thrust Mm, may break the grasp. In other words, if I, if I try to, to thrust it, I'm not holding on tightly, that sword can just easily fall, and then we are helpless. It requires true heroism to grasp that, to hold on to the word when everything says, don't bother, or it's not working, or he's not able, or it's not powerful enough. I'm living in a time, and you are living in a time, when God's word is under constant attack. People wanting to, to 
dummy it down, to change the wording, to take out certain words and phrases because they don't, they're offensive to everyone. His word is under attack. I know pastors who don't believe in the inerrancy of the scripture. I know one pastor who doesn't believe in the virgin birth. He has rejected. Why is he even a pastor if he rejects the virgin birth? I know another pastor who says you can only trust everything in the New Testament in red. Everything that Jesus said. Everything else is not trustworthy. Why Why even bother reading it then? His word is under attack, and it takes true heroism to take a stand on his word and say, Thus saith the Lord. His word declares. It calls sin, sin, and that has never changed. The world may change the definition of sin, but God's word stays true. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it calls out to the righteous, and it calls out to the sinners, and it calls out to hearts, and it is powerful. But notice that Eliezer's grasp was made stronger through the conflict. This is important. His grasp didn't grow weaker through the conflict and the battle. His grasp became stronger. When you get pushed... When you get mm, overwhelmed by the enemy, hold on. Hold your grasp. Tighten your grasp on his word. Sleep with your Bible if you have to. Hold it tight to you. Don't let go of his word. It's easy to do, to compromise, to, to find other weapons, but there's no greater weapon than his word. Now hear this. Whatever we hold shapes the grasp. If I hold my wrist, it shapes my grasp. If I hold my finger, it shapes my grasp. Whatever I hold shapes my grasp. If I hold doubt, fear, unbelief, drugs, alcohol, sex, Fame, whatever I hold on to, shapes me. But if I hold on to the word, that shapes my grasp. I want my grasp to be conformed to his word, mm, so tightly gri gripped in my hand. The more firmly we grasp, the more efficiently we use the words. You see, this is why I think it's two-edged. God puts his word in me, one edge. God brings it out of me, second edge. I have the power of the word inside of me, one edge. When it comes out of my mouth through the power of the Holy Spirit, remember it's his sword. When it comes out, it's a double edge and it has power. It has power inside of me to change me and it has the power coming out of me to change whatever is out here. It is double edged for that purpose. Let me say it again. It goes into you one side powerfully but when it comes out of you it's even more powerful because it's the sword of the spirit and when the sword cleaves to our hand and the hand grows weary we can still fight on Eleazar the son of Dodo still fought on he did not give up though he became weary and it, he clung to it he never ever gave up his hand froze to the sword even in his weariness, and the battle must have seemed hopeless at times, but Eliezer's hand instinctively, instinctively clung to his sword, and he would not let go. And then the account says, therefore, the Lord brought about a great victory that day. We will never have victory if we let go of the sword. Until the sword is firmly grasped in our hands, we will never, ever have victory. And then it said the people followed after Eleazar and plundered the Philistines. You see, not only do you win the battle, you get the spoils of the battle. Hallelujah. So let me give you one final scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not 
war or battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, the things that God has given us to do, are not earthly or carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your disobedience is fulfilled." Here's the gist of that verse. We don't battle the way the world battles. We don't battle with anger, frustration, doubt, fear. We don't battle with with, um, harsh words. We don't battle with putting people down or yelling at them. We don't battle with our fists. We don't battle with, with guns. We battle with the word of God. And it says it's powerful to draw, pull down strongholds. Casting down everything, listen to that scripture, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Not just God, but what you know about God. What you know that you know that you know that you know about God. You see, that's what Satan wants to get inside your head about. That you stop knowing that you know. He wants you to doubt what you know and wonder if it's true what you know. But God said, our weapons are not of this world because we're dodos. I want to be a dodo. And I never want to lose my grip on his word because it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. If you do not know the one who is this word, his name is Jesus. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to live a victorious life. If you don't know him, let us help you. Contact us at the office. Get online. Get on the website. Get through Facebook. And let us introduce you to this Jesus, this living word, this powerful word. He loves you. And he's painting a picture of your life with him victoriously, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.